All right, so uh, we had a few minutes to do this warm-up question. If you're watching the video, you can pause it, take a couple seconds to try this out. Uh, who wants to lead us through how they took the derivative of this function? Anita? Okay, so you did ln 3 yeah. times three to, the power of x. 3 to the x, okay. And then I did e to the power of sine x okay. times cos x. Plus cos. So this is product rule, right? So you got the first part, correct? It's derivative of the first times the second. And then Grayson, want to pick it up from there? Perfect. Yes, technically we do take the derivative of the inside of x. So we don't have to write that, but if you want to, that's fine. Okay, and then I think we have a common 3 to the x, e to the sine x. So let's just remove that. And we'll be left with the ln of 3 plus cos x. Well, ln e is one. one but, I'm saying but yes, technically, but for e to the x, we don't really ever write times ln e because we know that we'll just get back e to the whatever. Uh, Kaylee, yeah. So we have to multiply by the derivative of the exponent of e. So whenever we do the derivative of anything with e, like for instance, if we do the derivative of e to the 2x, we do, we get back e to the 2x, but then we have to kind of apply chain rule here and multiply by the derivative of the exponent. So here we multiply by 2. So we're doing something similar to that. We're taking the derivative of e to the sine x. We get e to the sine x back, back and then we multiply by the derivative of the exponent, which is cos x here. Does that make sense? Yep, no problem. Any other questions on this one? Of a rational function like 2 to the 1 over x. Kind of like that. Yeah, so I would probably, before I took the derivative here, I would probably do 2 to the negative x, or actually it's x to the negative 1. And then I would just do the derivative that way. Um, but let's say if you had something that's like a rational function, maybe you have like 2x over, I don't know, x squared plus 1. Yeah. When you do the derivative of this, you'll have to apply quotient rule to do the derivative. So it'd be like ln 2 times 2 to the exponent that you have times the derivative of that exponent using quotient rule. Yeah, good question. Sorry. <laughs> um, any homework questions? We'll pause the video quickly here. All right, so today we're going to take a look at some of the applications of some of the derivatives that we've been finding um, in the second half of this unit, which is exponential functions. Um, so some types of things that we use derivatives of exponential functions to analyze would be uh, things like uranium-233. This is a radioactive material uh, that's found in nuclear power generators, um, and it produces a wealth of harvestable energy as it decays. So it doesn't occur naturally, so a series of nuclear reactions are required to produce it. So it's called a breeding chain. Um, so analysis of exponential decay functions is actually important for understanding how things like nuclear reactors work. Uh, we're also going to take a look at uh, an example with a radioactive isotope, which is used in the treatment of liver disease. So that would be gold-198. Uh, and we're going to suppose that a 6 milligram sample of this gold is injected into a liver. The sample decays to 4.6 milligrams after one day. Assume that the amount of gold 198, uh, <laughs> this is supposed to say remaining, <laughs> sorry. Uh, remaining after t days is given by our function n at t equals n initial or n naught, sometimes we call it. And then it's going to be e to the exponent, this is the Greek letter lambda, um, times t. So lambda, 
if we look over here, just this is a little summary of what that is. It's called the disintegration constant. Um, and you'll see the disintegration constant uh, with a variety of radioactive substances. So any questions that we deal with with radioactive decay um, will have a specific disintegration constant, which is specific to that particular uh, isotope. So we are going to figure out the disintegration constant for gold 198. All right, so we have a six milligram sample that decays to 4.6 milligrams after one day. So I'm gonna put that 4.6 into the future value and the 6.0 milligrams will go into the initial value. E is already entered in for us. That's the natural decay uh, or that's the natural exponential base here. And then we're finding the disintegration constant. What's our time? Time is one day. All right, so before you use logarithms here, you have to get the base and the <coughs> exponent that you're trying to solve for isolated. Okay, because we're dealing with base E, we're gonna take the ln of both sides rather than taking log of both sides. So we'll ln and ln, meaning we can bring this disintegration constant down in front as a multiple. So we have negative lambda times ln e, and the nice thing about using ln here is that ln e actually equals one. So uh, if we find the ln of 4.6 over 6.0 and multiply it by negative one, we will have our disintegration constant. So if we were to leave this as a more precise answer, we could leave it here, um, or we can kind of calculate approximately what that would be. Grayson's getting 0 0.2 two, six, something or other. You guys all got that as well? So, and negative, right? No. Oh, yeah, yeah, because you multiply it by the negative. Yes, correct. <laughs> 2.6, let's say 5, 7. Okay, and if we entered in time in days, then your disintegration constant is talking about how quickly the radioactive substance decays, so this is in days as well. Is it not like milligrams per day, or is that Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it is actually. I think you're right. I'm gonna double check my solutions on that one. I think it is milligrams though. Oh no, it's just days. Oh yeah, Gabby could have told me. <laughs> yeah, we'll stick with days. Kind of like it's kind of like related to like so you know how like back in advanced functions we had like half lives and doubling periods and things like that so we had to figure out like how long does this take to double or how long does this take to half this is kind of telling us how long it takes to like grow or uh, I guess decay by e or 1 over e I should say because the exponent is negative yeah okay Part B, determine the half-life of gold 198. So now we're actually finding the half-life period. So we should actually be able to, once we've found the half-life, we could express this uh, formula differently in terms of a half-life formula rather than base E. Um, so half-life, if I'm looking to figure out how long that takes uh, in the initial sample is six, we'll set the future sample to three. Basically what's always gonna happen here is when you divide, you're gonna end up with half on the left. Um, so we have half e to the negative 0.2657t. So the time that this takes is actually going to give us the half-life period. So how long does the substance take to half? So when we divide out 6, we get half. That should always happen if I'm solving for the half-life. So if you want, you can just enter in half right away there. 
and then we'll solve for the t that makes that happen. So you're going to lawn both sides, bring down your exponent as a multiple. If you want, you could even enter in that um, disintegration constant in its exact form up here, if you want to keep a little bit more accuracy. And we know ln of e is equal to 1. So we'll just divide ln of a half <coughs> by negative 0 0.2657. Or if you want further accuracy, greater accuracy, divide it by the exact value there. You did? So ln of a half should be negative, and then you divide by a negative. So I think we should get positive. Did you guys get like about 2.609? And this would also be in days. So that's how long the half life is how long it takes the substance to half once. Gab? Oh, okay, yeah, no worries, thanks. Any questions on this one? Okay, so the second part, as I mentioned, once we find the half-life, we can actually write the equation um, in terms of the half-life rather than in terms of base E. Um, so essentially, we kind of looked last year at some formulas where we had like A at T, or um, in this case, it will be N at T. This will be N initial. And it's asking us to write this as a half-life. So we do half to the exponent T over H, where capital H is the half-life. Um, so if we found the half-life to be 2.609 days, we're going to have n at t. The initial sample, we could leave as the initial sample, or if we know what it is, we can enter it in. In this case, um, we'll just leave it as n naught, or if you want, you can put in 6, whatever. Um, and then our half-life is 2.609, so we'll put that in as the half-life. All right, so if we want to figure out how fast the sample is decaying after three days, we can use our half-life formula or we can use our previous formula, and we should actually get the same answer out from each if we've done it correctly. Um, so I'm just going to use the original formula that we were working with here um, with base E. And key here is how fast. This is a rate of change. We're looking for the rate of change in how the sample is decaying at three days. So we're going to use N at T equals 6e to the negative 0 0.2657, is it? Yes. 657t. And we're going to find the derivative of this. Okay, also it's nice to use this as the function that we're deriving because we know that the derivative of e is just e. So we'll get back 6e to the negative 0 0.2657. And then we multiply by what? Yeah, derivative of the exponent. So the derivative of the exponent with respect to t is just the constant in front, or coefficient, I should say. OK, so we're just going to evaluate this and prime at t. So sub in 3 into your equation, and we'll see what we get. Is it okay to get a negative here? Yes. What does that mean? It's decaying really smaller and smaller now. Yeah, and it's also decaying, right? So it should make sense that we get a negative here because if we got a positive, that actually means that the rate of change is increasing. Um, so this is milligrams per day. We're losing 
or the substance is decaying by 0 0.72 milligrams per day. So this is actually, um, this isn't at all points, right? So this is just at particularly uh, day three. So I guess we can say at day three. Our radioactive isotope, gold 198, is decaying by 0 0.72 milligrams per day. But we know because this is a curve, the rate of decay is always changing throughout the time that we're looking at. Okay, so I will either say decaying by 0 0.72 milligrams per day, or you need to say like growing by negative 0 0.72. Preferably, we say it's decaying by 0 0.72 milligrams per day, which means that we're losing 0 0.72 milligrams each day at that point. Any questions on this one before we move to the next? Yeah, changing by negative, yeah. Probably better to use than the word growing because it's not actually growing. Okay. All right, so automatic, uh, automotive uh, shock absorber, uh, ab absorbers, that's a weird word. Um, <laughs> they are an example of what we call damped harmonic motion. So it's basically a pendulum and we call this a harmonic oscillator. Have you guys talked about this in physics? Yes, okay. So it's basically the object whose motion, an object whose motion repeats over regular time intervals. So we've looked at a lot of these things before with periodic motion. We know these are related to trig functions. Um, but just as like, if we just think about a regular pendulum or something that's swinging, if I imagine I have a string here and I, bring it over and I drop it, eventually we know that string actually is going to come to a stop, right? Or basically it's going to be moving so slowly that we can't see it anymore. Um, that's how normal motion works when we have like friction and air and things like that. So if something's moving, uh, let's say like you go over a bump with your car, your car will kind of bounce and then it comes to, it, it kind of looks like this, right? It's going to kind of come to a stop. So um, we can actually model these types of functions with a combination of a trig function and an exponential function. And you can kind of see on the graph here that you'll get this initial kind of spike in movement and then it will kind of taper off. Um, so that's kind of what we're taking a look at with this function. So uh, I've taken the liberty to kind of create a sketch of this for you using technology. And what we're actually interested in here is if this is the displacement, <coughs> and t is time in seconds, uh, I really am only interested in the part that starts at zero and moves forward, right? Because time can't really be negative. So I've created a little zoomed in version for you here where we kind of start at zero and move forward so that you can see this a little bit easy. Uh, a little bit more easily. Um, okay, so we can see here clearly there's an initial movement here where the uh, SUV goes over that bump and the, the SUV goes up and then, or I guess we should say the shock absorbers, they go up and then they kind of taper off as that movement stops. So there's a clear maximum here we can kind of see that that maximum's happening. There's also other critical numbers, um, but none of those will be maximums after that. There'll be local maximums and local minimums, uh, or I guess this will also be like the uh, absolute minimum. Um, and then we'll get some critical numbers after that, but the first one is really what we're most interested in. If we're trying to figure out a maximum or I'm trying to figure out the first minimum, those would be the, these would be the two points that I would be most interested in for a max and a min of this function. Okay, so that's part A. Determine when the maximum displacement of the sport utilities vehicle body occurs and uh, determine the maximum displacement. So we'll kind of do these together. So we're gonna figure out when and what that maximum displacement is. 
So in order to figure out a maximum of this function, maximum displacement, what do we need? We need the derivative of the displacement function, so we need to find h prime at t. Now this is an exponential function multiplied by a trig function, so we need to use product rule. So we're going to do derivative of the first, just zoom out a little bit here. Derivative of the first is negative 0 0.5 times e to the negative 0 0.5 t. Okay, so taking the deriv derivative of e, we get e back, and then we multiply by the derivative of the exponent, times the second, plus the first, times the derivative of the second, which is cos t. And if I'm trying to find a maximum here, I'm interested in where this function's derivative is equal to zero. Okay, so I'm going to common factor the e to the negative 0 0.5t. Um, we could. Doesn't really matter. Okay, so either, if I have something times something, either this is equal to zero, uh, but this one can't be, so there's no solutions to that section. Remember, we talked about how E exponential functions, they have horizontal asymptotes along Y equals zero. So this can't equal zero. This guy could potentially equal zero. All right, so this one in particular, uh, this is a little bit more challenging to solve than some of the other ones that we've looked at before. If I have a sine and a cosine in my function, that's going to be tough to solve unless I get this into one trig, one single trig ratio. So, um, well, we don't, ha we, we don't have to use implicit differentiation unless we are differentiating with respect to a different variable. All of these have the variable t. So my suggestion here is, is that we move the negative sine, negative 0 0.5 sine t to the other side. And I'm going to say if we divide out the cos of t from each side, you'll see why I'm doing this in a second. These will cancel. I'll be left with 1 over here. And what is sine t over cos t? Okay, so the goal here was to get one single trig ratio that we can actually solve for. We can solve if we have a single tan trig ratio. What? So this is equal to 1 right now, but I also need to divide out this 0 0.5. So if I do 1 divided by 0 0.5, I'm actually solving for where tan t is equal to 2. I could have, if I wanted to, I could have divided sine t out from this side, but then I would be solving for cotangent, which is a little bit tougher because I don't have cotangent stored in my calculator. So if I did that, I'd have to do the reciprocal anyways after and use tangent. So the goal would be like ideally that we get sine, cos, or tan in one of these so that we can actually solve. Okay, so we will go through this decision-making process that we learned in advanced functions. Can I get this? Can I get tan of two or tan of an angle equals two from a graph? We're not super familiar with the graph of tan. We did do it in advanced functions, but probably not. Triangle? No? Okay, so we go calculator on this. Um, I would expect to get answers for where tan is positive in quadrants two or one, sorry, and three. I'm really probably only interested in the one that is in the all quadrant because I'm interested in the first critical number that happens here. But just in case we happen to get something that's maybe like in the negative section, we can see in the bigger picture of the graph that there's also like maximums and minimums in the negative section. You can find both answers and then just kind of see which one's giving you max, which one's giving you min, just in case. So we're going to do tan inverse of two on our calculator. Make sure you're in radian mode. Should get an answer. The first answer will be in the all quadrant. 1.107. Everyone else get this? Yeah. Okay. 
So we can also use this as our reference angle to find the other t. So this will be time 1, time 2. If this is pi, how do we calculate time 2 here? Yes, so we'll add 1.107 and pi. And that gives us about 4.249. Okay, we can see pretty clearly from the graph um, that 1.107 is probably where we're hitting that maximum there, right? So that looks pretty accurate. And then the 4 is where we're hitting that minimum. Now, if we don't have a graph, we don't necessarily know that, so we do just want to double check. Um, but we can see graphically that those are where the max and min are occurring. Um, so if we had to find min, we would be using that second answer. We're finding max. We're going to use the first answer. Um, just in case you don't have the graph, we're going to check both. Um, so plug these into your h at t formula. So it would be the original formula that we started with. Okay, and then we're going to plug in h at 4.249 as well, just to do a little check here. Grayson, you got the first one? Did everyone else get that? Yes. And if we look at the graph, that looks actually pretty accurate. It's just past 0 0.5, so I think that sounds like it's that's good. This is in meters, yeah. Okay, which what do we get for H at 4.249? Negative 0 0.106, did you say? Okay, and that basically means it's okay to have, like, this is displacement, so we are talking about, like, from the resting point, we can go up and we can go down, right? So that's going to be, obviously, our minimum, and this guy's going to be our maximum. Okay, so the answers to both of the questions, therefore, the maximum displacement... is 0 0.5141 meters and it occurs at 1.107 seconds. Okay, this is like a little bit like overly exact. I'll let you know what I want you to round to here. Probably be more like about two decimal places. Um, but it's nice to keep a couple decimal places when you're actually valuing